Good evening and welcome to the Gathering Place here in Simi Valley. We're really grateful that you're here with us tonight. And um, if you look at the title, it says, Are you walking in sonship or are you waiting for the rapture? And there's a lot of people waiting for the rapture and um, they have a long wait. And they're really, they're really moving in a wrong direction. But before I get into that, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Asbury Revival. And, and I believe it's actually just the tip of the iceberg. Yes. Bob Jones gave a prophetic word, and the word was that when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, there would be a great move of God, a great revival. And that happened about three years ago. Um, they won it, but that there was no great revival, but they won it again this year. They just won it, and... The quarterback, who's, who's um, he's the best quarterback in the league, his ankle was severely injured in one of the playoff games, and he prayed, and he said God healed him, and he came back and won the next playoff game, and then came back and won the Super Bowl and was the MVP, and he gave glory to God. And um, But I like the prophecy that Bob Jones gave, and um, something that Johnny Enlow said I thought was really good. He said this is like the second witness, so I'm accepting it. The thing is different uh, now than what happened um, three years ago is that there is a, seems like a sovereign move of God that has broken out in Asbury, Kentucky. Yes. It's just broken out. And the people are just, they, they haven't stopped praying or worshiping for I think over eight days or more than that. I think it's more than that now. I think it was even before the Super Bowl. So I'm going to read, um, Amy, you sent me this today. I'm going to read a little bit of this to you. It's a testimony from somebody that was there. And the interesting thing was, uh, last night on Tucker Carlson, he actually interviewed the student body president of the school, and she told him what was going on. He was very favorable to her. He was not. Um, he didn't punk her at all. He wasn't, you know, didn't pull a Geraldo Rivera or anything like that. He was very uh, affirming. And, you know, she just told what was going on. It was pretty amazing. So in this testimony, it says, it's 3 a.m., I'm sitting in my car leaving Asbury after being surrounded by such a powerful presence for the last eight hours. I can't even begin to fully put into words what is happening at the Asbury Revival. But allow me to try. And this is different than, uh, than what happened with Todd Bentley and, <clears throat> and that went on in Florida. That was a great move, too. But this is something different. There's, there's no seeming leader here. First, I must say that you have to experience something like this firsthand. From the second I drove into town, I was speechless. Cars lined the streets, parking lots overflowing, people praying on the sidewalks and under trees. I love that. Strangers showing love to strangers. That's the move of God right there. When you, because God is love. So when you start to see the love of God, that's a revelation of who he is. Such a small town quickly, quickly populating with hundreds of followers. Normally I'd be nervous or even refuse to walk into such an environment with so many people, but today it was easy walking up to the chapel. You hear many voices rejoicing, echoing through the doors, but nothing can prepare you for what you'll see when you enter. Almost every seat filled with folks lining the walls, everyone singing the same songs, many saying different prayers for different reasons, but everyone's worshiping the same God. While, I, while finding a seat, more people began to find their voice. The songs rang louder and louder through the chapel as the night advanced and God's power humbled everyone in the room. I saw tears of joy, tears of brokenness, cries of surrender, shouts of thanks. Children behaved, their <laughs> behaved and parents modeled what it looked like to be love and life for God. People in every stage of life came together today. Many emotions were felt, but one thing is certain. We all felt the power of God. Souls were saved. Every chain broken. The spirit in the room radiated from one person to the next. So much so, it made its very way to three different chapels. If you have the opportunity, I insist you talk to God about making the trip. Experience God's power. Bring it back home to you. People have come from all over the country, and they do not regret it. Let this be your chance to begin living by God's example. If you feel drawn to this revival, 
that I promise it's because you were meant to take part. Bring a friend to church or a car full. You'll never know whose life you could bring, uh, bring to being saved. Before I end this post and start my drive home, I must say this. Many of Asbury University students caught my eye tonight watching this generation come together in such a vulnerable way in front of so many people. Setting an amazing example struck me. To have no shame in God's game is hard sometimes, but they should be extremely proud. Simply watching them worship was moving and whoever has led these young people in loving the Lord should be proud too. He is working. I think that's amazing. That's just, that's just, the, that's the sovereign grace of God. And I believe that's what not only America is going to experience, but I believe that's going to be experienced in the world. That's what we're praying for. Just the sovereign move of God. Just the Holy Spirit to begin to move like that. Don't get me wrong. I had as much fun casting that demon out on Saturday morning than anybody. You know, if you say, well, can I see it online? We took it offline because we want to protect the person's identity. But, um, yeah, that was pretty amazing. So I love that kind of stuff. And it's fun, but it's even more fun when the Holy Spirit just does it on his own. You know, when it's just, when there's something sovereign. And that's what, that's what America needs. That's what the world needs. All right. Um, we're going to get into this. I want to read this, this verse, which I probably should have read on Saturday. So we're talking about the grace of God. And I don't know about you, but I have found myself praying for grace more this week than I have in a long time. And I found myself experiencing that grace. Experience the presence of it. So I want to read this to you. In Hebrews 4.16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what I want you to do tonight, as soon as I find it, I want us to pray for God's grace together tonight. You ready to do that? Yes. My wonderful Father in heaven, tonight we bless your name. And as a body, we come boldly to your throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Father, I ask in the covenant name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give unto me the grace from the throne of grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, your abundant grace. And I pray that the spirit of grace would be upon me this week. Teach us tonight, Heavenly Father, how to walk in your grace and how to walk in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the prayer goes, it goes, it's a much longer prayer than that, but I think that's enough for us tonight. And so I want you to do something for me. I want you to stretch your hands out and I want you to just pray. Why don't your hands stretch out, Randy? <laughs> and pray for me. Ask God to give me grace. Go ahead and do that. I would have grace to speak tonight. Grace to follow him. I receive your grace, Father. I received all the prayers. I received the grace tonight. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I believe, I felt the Holy Spirit on Saturday morning. I felt him saying, I want to do something in, in the beginning of the meeting. When I, I feel like when you guys prayed for me to have grace, that as I started speaking and I just, I looked over at that, I don't want to say her name. And I saw something there and I just said, I want to pray for you. And she was in extreme pain. And when she came up, the moment I put my hand close to her, the, the glory of God caused the demon to manifest. Now, this is a woman of God and a woman of prayer, but it was a physical attack. A lot of us don't realize that most of the 
demons that Jesus cast out were physical. Amen. Most of the sickness was physical. Remember the woman that was bent over and he healed her? And when they, they said, well, you're healing on the Sabbath, you shouldn't be doing that. And he goes, he goes, should not this woman who's a daughter of Abraham or a daughter of the covenant who Satan has bound low these 18 years? She had been bound by a demonic spirit for 18 years in her body. And so we're going to be starting to cast that kind of stuff out. There are going to be people that you see maybe in the store, maybe who knows wherever. They're going to be in pain and you're just going to say, hey, hey can I pray for you? And you might encounter it. You might encounter a demon. Um, it may not be as severe as screaming out like, you know, what happened Saturday, but you might encounter something that's there that will manifest anyways. So I want to read to you from Ephesians 9. And he said that to make all men see was the fellowship of the mystery. Now, remember, we, we just touched on verse six and seven Saturday. So we're just, we're in a continuation to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. And I know we read this a week or two ago, but let me just read it again to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Going back to the 10th verse, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Okay. <clears throat> Remember, I gotta stay here. <laughs> so I wanna just touch base a little bit. I was, I was listening to Johnny Enlow, um, his last couple of sessions, I actually was listening to some of it today. And um, it reminded me of a book uh, it was a book written by Jonathan Welton called Raptureless. It was a really good, it was a really good book. And he, um, he came here to speak. And when he did, I got up and I started talking about how the rapture wasn't happening. You know, like, like we have a lot of time left and it was just by the Holy Spirit. So he came up and then he just followed up on it. I didn't realize he'd written a book on it, but it's, it's an amazing book. And <clears throat> I'm just gonna give you a little of the premise as we get into some of this stuff tonight, because I believe that this mentality has kept more people away from their true destinies and their rulership than anything. And that's, that's kind of believing in really a false doctrine. And it's a doctrine that makes people afraid. It's a doctrine that makes people look for the antichrist. And we've gone over this, you know, here multiple times that the word antichrist is only ever used in first and second John. I think it's like four times. And, but you know, everybody's looking for the antichrist. You know, Barack Obama was the antichrist. And they went through scripture and showed it. Listen, there are many antichrists. That's what John said. There are many antichrists because it's a spirit. Adolf Hitler was under that spirit. There are many, it's just, he's just an example. Alexander the Great, Napoleon. There have been many antichrists over the years. If we give our power to the antichrist spirit, then it has the power to rise. So in the, in the 70s, or well in the 60s, they had a move of God, but then it kind of got hijacked a little bit. In the 70s, there was the late great planet Earth. I'm not trying to pick on the author either. I'm sure he was very dedicated in his walk to God. But there was the late great planet Earth, and... They were judging everything off of Israel becoming a nation and not really looking back at a lot of what you, you can see in the book of Matthew. You know, things where when you, if you're on the rooftop and you see them coming, you know, run, don't go pack anything. Well, who sits on a rooftop? Nobody. That was something they did back then. That's something they did in Israel. Those, those scriptures were for that time. They were for 70 AD when Titus came in and wiped them out. And there's something I thought Johnny said was really good. And, and I wish I could remember all of the exact exactness of the rapturous book. But according to Daniel's prophecy, the rock which the builders rejected, the unhewn stone that came down on the feet of the giant, which represented the governments of the world up to that time, 
When that came down, it said, of his government, there will be no end. So here we are. We've been believing for the Antichrist. (laughs) We've been believing for the Antichrist since I can remember. And in the 1980s, I remember 1979, 1980, sitting around with my friends, just newly really turned on to God. uh, The rainbow money's already printed. You know, we're like ready to go. You know, and then uh, in the 90s, you know, it was everything. Russia's ready to come down on Israel. And, you know, 1988, 88 reasons why Jesus would return in 1988. So all of this, all of this stuff that never happened. And then there were all kinds of books for the year 2000. And I, I'm just, I'll tell you this straight. I won't tell you the author's name, but one of the books they said, uh, let's just say somebody from TV and I won't even say their name somebody that I knew very well said, um, we had to actually make this author get on and apologize for all of the false stuff they said in the book. And they said, mostly older people that were afraid. Why would you be afraid when you're older? If you serve Jesus all your life, you should be growing in dominion and authority, not becoming more frightened. I, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, I don't have any fright. When the whole COVID thing came, <laughs> Zero fright. And I'll be honest with you, I'm less frightened now than I've ever been of anything like that. But well, couldn't it come and hit your mind? Of course it could, but I have to, I'd have to resist it for sure. But we have dominion over these things. But unfortunately, we've been trained, I should say us, by 2023, we should know better. But a lot of the church is trained and waiting for the rapture. I remember listening to this great teaching many years ago on on how Jesuit priests actually created the doctrine of the rapture. It was never a doctrine of the church. Anyways, I I don't want to get so much into that part of it. You can go on uh, Elijah Streams and listen to uh, number 44 with Johnny Enlow. He goes into a lot of it. I think he does a really good job. It's not particularly thorough. But if you get the book Rapture List, that one is is quite thorough. And it will really explain a lot of things. It explains about how Nero, um, you know, the sign of the the sign of the beast and Nero, they called him a, they called the statue of Nero the beast. And and him the man of sin. And when you went into the marketplace, you know, if you wanted to buy or sell in the marketplace, you had to bring your offering there, put it on the altar, and then they would take ash from the altar and they would put it on your your hand or your head, and then you can go and you can buy and sell. No, Bob, the modern movies, it's different. They're going to give me a chip. I wouldn't take that either, but I'm just saying there's a lot of things that we've been taught that have made us powerless in a generation. As a matter of fact, we've been fighting just to have enough finances to get by and, and, and just to get our bodies healed. We haven't been walking in sons because we haven't been taught to walk in sons, I should say, as a whole. But I believe that God is releasing that doctrine throughout his church, throughout the world, that we begin to learn to walk in sonship. Uh, so I'm going to read this 10 first again. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, that doesn't just mean the demons, that means the angels as well might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Does that mean that, that we're going we're gonna to have revelation that the angels are listening for? Yes. Yes. We're the body of Christ. Don't get me wrong. The angels are going to come and they're going to bring you lots of stuff. But we have revelation that we're going to get directly from the Father. And the angels are going to be like, what's that? The Passion Translation Same verses. My passion is to enlighten every person to this divine mystery, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. It was hidden for ages past until now and kept a secret in the heart of God, the creator of all. The purpose of this was to unveil before every throne and rank of angelic orders in the heavenly realm, God's full diverse wisdom revealed through the church. God's full, diverse wisdom revealed 
through the church. That's you. Bob, I'm just hanging on. Maybe. But it doesn't change your sonship. A lot of times, there's a lot of people who have been hanging on because they didn't know who they were. You know, it's like, I'm sure you've heard the story, the guy, you know, many years ago when people traveled by boat. You know, my dad first came to America, he came on the uh, Queen Mary 2 or whatever it was. And um, that's how he traveled here. That's how a lot of people traveled across the oceans back then. Anyways, this gentleman, he just had enough money to buy a, a ticket. He had very little else, so he scraped together a few bucks and he bought crackers and cheese. And so the whole trip he was eating his crackers and cheese and then the, the steward came to him and he said, uh, what are you doing? We have the whole uh, uh, dining area there. It was like the last day of the trip. And he goes, oh, I don't have money for that. He goes, oh, it's all part of the price. It's all, it's all been paid for. You already, you know, it's already yours. So here he was eating crackers and cheese when he could have been feasting the whole way. And that's kind of how it's been for the body of Christ. We've been eating crackers and cheese when we have the dominion and the revelation to even, that even the angelic beings are looking for wisdom from us because they look from the Lord. The Amplified Translation says, also to enlighten all men and make plain to them what is the plan. Regarding the Gentiles and providing for salvation of all men of the mystery kept hidden throughout the ages and concealed until now in the mind of God who created all things by Jesus Christ. The purpose is that through the church, the complicated, many-sided wisdom of God in all its infinite variety and innumerable aspects might now be made known to the angelic rulers and authorities, principalities and powers in the heavenly sphere. That, that's pretty awesome. Can I get an old me? You can't say amen. amen. I mean, that's, that's just, that's awesome. That's telling us that we have complete dominion as the sons of God, that even the angels, the angels who are, it says ministers for the heirs of salvation, the angels are learning things from us. And if we speak something in the name of the Lord, if we speak a command in the name of the Lord, the angels will actually have to submit to that command because it's from the Lord, they're submitted to him. But if it comes from you and it's anointed by God, the angels will act on that. Not just that they, they have to, but they even want to. What's God saying? He's saying the input from heaven to earth is going to flow through you. So think 90% of Christians, they live in the natural realm. The most supernatural thing that they're aware of is a science fiction movie. Like they can believe in magic in a movie or science fiction or something like that, but they can't believe in the supernatural, in the realms of God, in the dominion of God. And uh, then we get attacked from, let's call it the second heaven. Well, let's just say this. Demons. Let me just show you something. Put a little drawing here. This is you standing on the earth. Demons can't stand on the earth. They have no dominion on the earth. Remember Lester Sumrall telling us a story? He, was a, he had a great dominion over demons. He told the story of this witch doctor in the Philippines. He had been, you know, basically sacrificed to Satan or given to Satan from the time of his birth. You know, they put chicken blood on his mother's stomach and they dedicated him to Satan. 
And by the time he was just a boy, six or seven, they, nobody could deal with him. He was so unruly. Because so many demons had just manifested. So he went to live with his aunt, who was a witch, and she raised him up. And he had 350 different demons that would come to him. And they would come to him and they would say, I'm going to use you tonight. So he said, there were some demons they liked to drink. So if they liked to drink, they would come. He would have to drink. And he said he would wake up a lot of mornings in the cemetery sitting on a grave naked. But yet he worked in the presidential palace in the Philippines. And because of these demons, he could tell them things that were going on in Washington, D.C. Things were going on in the White House. So that gave him a place. But he said when the demons would come to him, he said sometimes they, you know, they look very different, but sometimes he goes, they look so much like a human being that he goes, the only way I could tell they were demon was to look at their feet because the, the demons have no dominion or authority on the earth. They have no earthly dominion. So their feet would be above the ground and he could tell it was a demon. Obviously, he got delivered from all of that and got free from that. <clears throat> but demons do not have authority or dominion on the earth. Therefore, they need people to give them the dominion. Uh, so, the Bible was mostly written by what? By visions and dreams, right? So, if you want to change the vision, if you want to give a satanic vision, what do you do? Well, you have a picture that tells a vision or television. So they tell a vision and they give you a vision. Now, has there ever been a movie where the man of God was powerful and thrust demons through the wall? No. You got some guy walking in there like all pious, you know, self-righteous, oh, carrying beads, or whatever. No. In the name of Christ, I, you know, and has no authority whatsoever. If you notice when I was casting that demon out on Saturday, I wasn't going, in the name of Jesus, you leave her. It was just, come out! Because the authority is there. As so they sit there and they do the beads and then somebody's head spins and they throw up on them and throw them out the way, Whatever. But, you, but, you know, the, the, the man of God is always, the, he's the idiot that gets destroyed. And that's the complete opposite. Because demons have no dominion. The power of, the power, you know, holding a cross, the power of Christ compels him. If somebody comes up doing that, they have no idea how to cast out a demon. And just get away from them because they're going to draw demons. The power of Christ compels you. Know, you either know or you don't. You either walk with God and you have dominion or you don't. We're the sons of God. Why do we have dominion, Bob? Because as, as sons of God, we don't spend enough time with the Father getting instruction from Him. How do we do that? That's why He gave us the Holy Ghost. He said, see all this stuff that looks so good that you want to ask me for? I got something above all of it. It's called the Holy Ghost. So we have the Holy Ghost. You know, let me tell you something. Jesus, he didn't just cast out devils because of what he knew. It said he cast out devils by the spirit of God. I don't know about you. I've cast out a lot of devils. I would never want to even try to cast out a devil without the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, if Jesus, if Jesus was operating by the Holy Spirit, I think that's a good thing. So the Holy Spirit, his job is to reveal who you really are to you. So here we go. So, so here's, how, here's how we pray. <laughs> I don't always tell this, but we have a nice small little group tonight, so I can't. So here's how we pray. Lord, I'm struggling to make the payment on my house. And that might be a really legitimate thing. My, my car payment or, or my car is really bad. I need a new car. And I, I need a new car. And so... I say, you, you pray your prayer. You know, I pray according to Mark 11, 23 or 24. What things every desire when you pray, believe you receive, you shall have them. Say, pray, pray the prayer. And then say, Holy Spirit, help me to pray over this. And so you start praying the Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He starts praying and he starts going to heaven, to the throne. 
And he's praying that you come to know who you are. So that instead of being a beggar in the kingdom, you become a king in the kingdom with command. Instead of praying for food, you command it. Now, when Jesus went to the tree in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, when he went to the tree, it said he was hungry. I realized that he, I realized he revealed something by cursing the tree because it was a fig tree. And more than likely, the fig tree was what the tree that Adam ate of. Why do you say that? Because when he ate, he realized he was naked and the closest thing to him was fig leaves. <laughs> so he broke the curse. But when he went to the fig tree, he didn't go there because he was led by the Holy Spirit. He said he was led by his hunger. He said he was hungry. So he went to the tree, but then when there was nothing there, the time of figs was not yet, he said, no man eat fruit of the hereafter forever. He just spoke to it. He didn't say, Peter, do we have an ax or something? I, I'm so upset with this tree. Let's chop it down. No, he said, no man eat fruit of the hereafter forever. And he spoke to it. Now, I don't know if you've ever done anything like that. If you've ever spoken to plants or trees. I speak to plants sometimes. But I had a tree in our, in our house in Chatsworth. We had these two trees. They were identical. And um, I don't know how long they'd been there. Probably since the house was built. And we had been there for a long time. And one tree, one, one, one year, one of the trees died. The other tree was sprouting and it had been weeks and then months. And it was just dead, it was no longer living. And so I thought, um, have the gardener come and take it out. But then I had another thought. You know what, I'm gonna speak to this tree. Why don't you think of that first? Because I'm like you. I don't always think of things like that first. Uh, so I went to the tree and I just, I just said, I command the life of God to come into you. I command you to live. I command death to leave your roots and your stems. And I command life to come into your branches, to come into your roots. And I just spoke to it for like a couple minutes. Within two weeks, it was blossoming and it was alive. And it's still alive to, you know, at least the day that I left there. We, we can speak to trees. We can do that or we can cut them down, but Jesus didn't cut the tree down. He spoke to it. Now, he when he did it, it didn't take two weeks. When he spoke to the tree, it was dead the next day from the roots. So why did he do it? Well, he was probably a little bit miffed. He was hungry and he got there. There was nothing there. He's a little bit miffed, a little bit upset. Jesus, Jesus never got upset. No, that's not true. And the man with the withered hand, he said he looked around on them with anger. Because he asked me, he goes, is it, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or not? To, to heal this man's hand. And they wouldn't answer him. So he said he looked on them with anger. He was upset because the spirit was so religious or so legalistic that they would rather leave this man, this who had been this way for how long, than to heal him. Well, that's just, that's just a legalistic spirit. All right. Let's see if we can move on. Verse 11. According to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God has an eternal purpose. <laughs> Does he? Let's see if I can get this pen out here. I don't know where it looks like it's working. All right. So Greek, the Greeks taught us linear, right? Logical, linear. We think of time, everything we think of from linear. But the Hebrews, they thought circular. Let's say you get a prophetic word. And doesn't seem to come to pass. 
You're praying, you're believing, but nothing. What does that mean? Well, it means that you did a circle and you got back, but something didn't happen in you to be able to, be able to receive that word. So what happens? You start over again. Doesn't God change his mind, Bob? No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, God doesn't change his mind about you. What he's called you to, what he's called you to be, he doesn't change his mind. The number one thing he's called you to be is the son of God. Male or female, it doesn't matter. He's called you to have the authority of the number one son, sonship. That's the number one thing. But he's also, everything that he gave Adam, he meant for you. But then after Adam ate of the tree and we lost that, Jesus retrieved it back. But then he gave us something more. So in Luke, it says that Adam was the son of God. He was already above the angels. But now, when the word of God had to come and redeem us, it says in Corinthians that we have become a new creature. We become something different, something more. So even though Adam was a son of God, we are a cut above a son of God. We are the son of God, or we are God and son of God. Because we are the word of God. He's the word of God. We're the word of God because we're one with him. You know, I don't know anybody in this room that says, you know, I'm going to park my body here for a while. I'm going to float off and take my head and float off. I've got to go do some things. I don't want to give my body some rest. No, your, your body goes wherever your head is. He's the head. We're the body. So because we've been taught such feeble teachings uh, through the, the centuries, really, and then through the, the last decades that a lot of people are just they're just you know they're just so happy that that God will even consider to hear anything they say oh Lord please hear me when every word that comes out of their mouth could be a divine revelation from God let me ask you a question is the Holy Spirit God yes. yeah so if the Holy Spirit speaks, is what he says a God thing? Yes. So, so the Holy Spirit is actually God speaking, right? Yes. So when you're praying in tongues, it says the Holy Spirit is giving you the utterance, but you're speaking by his utterance. So you're literally speaking the words of God. Like if I read a scripture, I'm speaking the word of God. But if I pray in tongues or I speak in tongues, I'm speaking the words of God or the Holy Spirit, who is God. I'm speaking God words. Who has the right to speak God words? The sons of God. You. Now listen. There's sometimes you'll have something happen in your life and you'll go, you know you're supposed to have dominion over it. And you go, ha, da, da, and you say something and you just don't believe it. And then it doesn't happen and you go, well, I mean, uh, maybe that doesn't work. Maybe it's the wrong. No, you just, you just haven't grown yet. You have the authority. You have the dominion. You just have to grow into it. So don't become discouraged in yourself. Don't become down on yourself. And let your teacher come and teach you some more. That teacher is the Holy Spirit. Now, when you, well, let me, let me, let me finish this. So God, he creates Adam and he has a plan. He has a plan for man. He gives man a seven day lease on the earth. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. Now, You say when God created the earth, you know, it was the, the, the morning and the evening were a day. He created them literally in the seven literal days. But prophetically, a day with the Lord, as Peter said, is, is a thousand years. So we would be in the sixth day, toward the end of the sixth day, coming to the seventh day, which would be a millennial reign. 
That would be the end of that would be the end of the lease that man has dominion on the earth for. So here's Adam, but he messes everything up. However, God comes and he corrects it. And so we are going to come all the way around from the beginning back to the beginning. Back to everything that Adam operated in, except at a higher level. So let's say you're called to deliver the children of Israel. Uh, your name is Moses. Oh, you messed up. You're 40 years old. You knew you're the deliverer. You knew that. You killed a guy, but he heard about it. You know, it got, got the word got out. And uh, you know, they find out Pharaoh's going to kill you. So you run for your life. So Moses, right here, he's ready to be the deliverer, but he's not. So what happens? It's all the way back around, 40 more years. So he thought 40, he's ready, but he wasn't. So he had to redo, he had to redo that circle. Cost him another 40 years. What if he wouldn't have been ready at 80? Would have been 120. Children of Israel, did God change his mind about them going to the land of promise? But they didn't believe him, so they didn't go in. They're supposed to go in right then and there. But they had a slave mentality, so they couldn't go in. So what happened? 40 years, right back to where they were. Now, it doesn't take 40 years for everything. What are you saying, Bob? What I'm saying is the call of God that's on your life beyond like, like the major call is who you are in Christ. I know nobody believes that because we believe the call is, you know, your apostle or your prophet or your business call. You know, we believe that the call of the giftings of the earth are greater, but they're not. Your sonship is greater than your call. You're not going to need to be an apostle in heaven. You might dance in heaven. You're not going to need to be a prophet in heaven. You're not going to need to be an evangelist in heaven. You're not going to need to run a business in heaven. So things that we have, gifts that we have on this earth, there'll be some that we take with us, but there's some that are unnecessary. So what's more necessary? Well, sonship. Now, we're not, we're not just there in heaven just hanging around. God is, has a kingdom that he's expanding. You are the rulers of that kingdom with him. So you're the envoys that he sends into all his creation. Now, if you were fully in your glorified body and you'd been in the presence of God directly for, you know, 5,000 years... And he said, there's some rebellious stuff going on in this planet over here. I want you to go and take care of it. Do you think if you went there that any being there could stand up to you? Do you think if God sent you anywhere that any being in his kingdom, any angelic being could stand up to you? They couldn't. Because you have the authority as a son. They couldn't stand up to Jesus. There was not a single demon, Satan himself, that could stand up to Jesus and then when he left his body, it said he took captivity captive. What does that mean? That means that he went down and he made, he made a show of them openly of all the principalities and powers. There was nothing that could stand against him. Well, what can stand against you? I don't know, Bob, I better learn the, the newest technique. That's the problem. We're learning the newest technique. Uh, there are many said they've said we cast out devils in your name because I, I never knew you. We did this. We did this for you. Yeah, but I never knew you. So he's given us sonship to know him. And then when we operate from sonship, we automatically manifest the kingdom. You tired, Brandon? Is he making you tired? 
Is it too warm in here? I, I don't like it warm because it makes people tired. You know, they're drowsy. Okay, let me try to finish quickly then. So, Passion Translation, this perfectly wise plan was destined from eternal ages and fulfilled completely in our Lord Jesus Christ. So, that now, I have to go to the next verse for that. I'm going to read on the Amplified. This is in accordance with the terms of the eternal and timeless purpose which he has realized and carried into effect in the person of Christ Jesus, our Lord. So here's, here's what happens to us when we're on the earth. We're either striving toward our sonship or we're getting ready for the Antichrist and the rapture. But you can't do both. It is 2023. And anybody believes that whatever timelines these guys were teaching were accurate at all? They've got to know that they were completely wrong. I mean, I don't, I, I don't see how anybody can believe that these prophecy teachers have any credibility whatsoever anymore. Listen, I, re I remember 1993, I believed all that stuff. Maybe you did too. What was the first thing that turned you around? Well, I was having breakfast with Kim Clement. And he'd had a death and life experience. And he'd been up in, he was up in the heavenlies for four hours. And he saw into the future. He saw like 60 years into the future. And he was telling me all about it. And I said, and I have, I've been around other prophets, but I've never seen another prophet like, like that operated like him. And I, I was like, wow, that shook my foundations, but in a good way. I realized we're not just here for, you know, I didn't think I was going to be here past in my 30s. Jesus returning. I mean, that was the doctrine everywhere. Jesus returning. He's going to be here any minute. I said, what happened? We basically gave a generation away just trying to scare them. Better get saved. Jesus is returning now. Also, nobody knew who they were as sons and nobody could do anything. So now we're trying to catch up and recapture lost generations. Generations literally were lost because of a false doctrine, a false end time doctrine. Does that mean that people that believe in the rapture are bad people? No, they're not bad people. It's just a doctrine they believe. Will Jesus return, Bob? Of course. When? I don't know. And honestly, to be honest, I shouldn't care. You know, they were all sitting around looking at Jesus when he left. They were all sad. And the angel said, what are you doing standing around? I mean, they weren't even nice. They were like, they really were like, what are you doing standing around? Get busy. Kind of heartless, I don't know. They're rough on those guys. Let's read these last verses. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Boldness for what? Boldness to step into the presence of God. Unashamedness. I mean, have you ever have you ever made God mad at you? I have. Or I, let's just say, let's say, I came into contact with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> one time I was upset with God and I was telling him what for not with curse or anything I don't I don't believe in that the profanity is the crutch of the conversational cripple it's the language of hell but I was telling God ah, and you didn't keep your word to me and I told him you didn't keep your word to me and the spirit of the fear of the Lord is I was driving and it came in and I was like I'm sorry. And I was just, I literally said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, of course, I was just trying to manipulate God. You didn't keep your word. You know, you do that with people. You know, people fall for it. Manipulate people. You try to do that with God, it doesn't work. I learned a long time ago, you can't manipulate God. Well, you know, if you don't do this, I might as well just, you know, you know, just hang that stuff up. It doesn't work on him. He's not moved by that. He's moved by faith. 
We have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. So Paul, he's even going through some stuff on their behalf. Passion translation, we have boldness through him and free access as kings before the father because our complete confidence is in Christ's faithfulness. God, I am an apostle. And therefore, I have status in your kingdom. It doesn't mean anything to him. He knows who you are. He made you. Paul said the apostles were the lowest of all. Aren't they the top ministry? Yeah. But he's saying it's not about that. It's about being sons of God. Yeah, you know, I've told this story before. I don't use the person's name because this was a friend of mine. And he's a really good person. Uh, somebody I love. And he was quite an evangelist. And he was really a pretty supernatural guy. And he'd gotten cancer. I don't want to say where. Because I don't want anybody even figuring it out. But he got cancer. And I remember him saying to me, he he'd actually had cancer before. And we prayed for him. He'd been healed. But he got cancer come back and I was talking to him and he goes Bob I don't understand I'm talking about a guy who in the Toronto Blessing danced off the stage into air this is a supernatural guy won a lot of people to Christ he goes, Bob I don't understand he goes I do this and he started telling me all the things that he did for God I do all these things and he hasn't healed me and I went to start to tell him the truth. Now the Holy Spirit just stopping. So he's like he's not going to hear you. What were you going to tell him? That everything he did for God was had nothing to do with him being healed. That his healing had nothing to do with all the things he did. He did anything you do for God, you do by grace, the grace that he gives you. But the healing that he gives you came by grace, and it can only be obtained by faith. By grace are you saved through faith. It's the same thing that you get saved by. By grace are you saved through faith. By grace are you healed through faith. Same thing. But if you're working for it, you're never going to get it. I'm doing this for the... I'm doing it. And, and because there's a social order in churches. I, I remember... I remember when I was doing a lot of stuff with Kim and everybody, everybody wanted, you know, they, to get, to get in. So they sometimes they'd think, Oh, you can give him access. And when he, God, he really hosed me one time when North Hollywood, he goes, you know, I'm establishing a thing out here. And he goes, and if you want to, you want to get to me, you got to talk to this guy, right? And he points me out and I'm just like, Oh man. So everybody took him at his word. And I had lines of people wanting to get to him. But I, I could tell people get close to the, to the close to him. They wanted, they they wanted to to get something from him, not necessarily be a friend to him. And they were looking for that social status. We're the sons of God, not the social statuses of God. I know you guys know this, but some people that are going to hear this may not know this, or maybe they're. Maybe they're striving because their relationship with God is a little bit lacking. So they're striving. But he's telling us here, we have boldness through him. We have free access as kings before the Father because of our complete confidence in Christ's faithfulness. Uh, and that, the Passion Translation just makes it so much clearer than the King James. I'm not going to read the 13th verse. We don't need that. I, I do want to look at it for the Amplified. In whom, because of our faith in him, we dare to have the boldness, courage, and confidence of free access, an unreserved approach to God with freedom and without fear. That's it. That's it. In the next verse, is he, starts, is he starts his second prayer. That's it. We have this unreserved approach to God with freedom without fear. The sons of God. So, listen, end time stuff is really fun. 
like a lot of that stuff, you know, it's really fun. And then, and then this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. Like there's a prophecy about 2029 that there's going to be a meteor hit the earth called, called Wormwood. And, you know, that stuff's great. It's fun. You know, I always watch, always like Star Trek and science fiction stuff. And I like Christian science fiction. I think it's fun. And I enjoy it. And it entertains me. But I realize it's just for entertainment. That, that which entertains me doesn't necessarily build my faith. But I have the Holy Spirit. I have, I have scripture that tells me the truth about who I am. Paul's letters are telling you who you are, who you've been made. I, I, every time I look through them, I'm just like, this is, I, I can't even, it's hard for me to fathom. Like, is that really true? <laughs> like, even though I know it, I've read it a hundred times. Like, can that actually be true? <sighs> I'm just... You shake your head going, is that real? Is it God really think of me like that? It just changes who you are. But the Holy Ghost, and I don't know how, but I just believe, I believe in this coming move that the children of God are just going to start walking around all day. Then they'd be driving in their cars. You're going to be, you know, on their job. They just be praying in tongues all the time. I mean, I mean, if you come to me and you go, you know, it's like, great, go pray. <clears throat> if you want to talk, then I need, I need some English. <laughs> but other than that, I think, I think we're going to have a lot of times where we're just praying and, what happens is, let's give you a little picture. Here you are. And you're praying in tongues. And this language is coming out of you. And what happens is, there's a spirit of revelation that just starts to surround you. Revelation 19.10, it says that, it says that prophecy is the spirit of Jesus Christ, right? So prophecy is the spirit of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 14, it says, when you speak in tongues, you speak not unto men, but unto God. No man understands it, but it said it edifies you. Well, when you prophesy, you edify the church. So if I speak in tongues, I edify myself. If I prophesy, I edify the church. So speaking in tongues is like, putting myself under a continual state of prophecy, which is Jesus Christ. He is the spirit of prophecy. So what's happening is I'm bathing myself in the spirit of Jesus Christ by the Holy Ghost because that's who I am. I'm not God the Father. I'm not the Holy Ghost. But you know who I am? I am the body of Christ. I am him. I'm one with him. He is the individual Christ, but I am the body of Christ. I'm him. I'm one with him. So therefore, who I really am is Christ. But I need to know that. So I have this teacher that when I pray in tongues, the spirit of prophecy, I'm just bathing in it until I become inundated with it. And suddenly I have this authority and dominion and realization of who I really am. And I'm not annoyed with everybody. What does that mean? It means you love people. But do you get annoyed? Yes, you can become very annoyed if somebody has an unclean spirit or a legalistic spirit. You might find yourself speaking to them with a great authority. I've seen that happen more than a few times. Not just myself. I've seen people just operating that. So when you're praying in tongues, all this revelation is just flowing around you. What happens? It starts seeping into your body and into your soul. And suddenly you just start knowing things. And then all of a sudden you're in a situation and you don't realize it and you speak and there's all this authority just comes out of you. You're like, 
Whoa, where'd that come from? Holy Ghost. I think that's about enough. It's all we can take tonight. So I don't even, I, you know what, I don't even want to take the time to, to do an offer. I mean, to, to speak about an offering. We're just going to receive the offering tonight. Uh, anybody that went to our Facebook, I mean, I went to our, our webpage. Hopefully you came to Facebook. Because that's where we are tonight. But if you're giving, you know, you can text it in. Or if you're making out a check, make it up to the gathering place or those that give to Soaring Ministries. Same when you're texting, you can scroll down, do it either one. How many of you feel just a little bit more dominion inside of you tonight? I know I do. I mean, I was up here saying it, but I, I feel that dominion. I feel that greater dominion. Pray this with me. I love you, Jesus. Let your blood cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I declare the blood of Jesus over my life, over my household, over my family. Lord Jesus, you are my high priest. So I bring my tithes and offerings to you. And I ask you to present them unto our Father as a sweet savor. Let it be an offering in righteousness. Father, we humble ourselves by proving you in this way. And we receive in our lives, in the state of California, in the United States of America, the opening of the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing there's not room enough to receive. And I thank you that you're rebuking the devourer for our sakes. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. I had a funny feeling today when I was praying. Not like, you know, somebody's tickling you, not that kind of funny, but... I had a funny feeling today when I was praying about finances. And I realize you guys aren't interested in that at all. So I'll say as little as I can about it. But I have this sensing that there's an outpouring of dominion in the financial realm. That we can begin to take dominion in the financial realm. And then God reminded me of a word that Kim Clement had given me. It was a tremendous word. I remember it. I'm not going to say exactly what it is because you just, you just look and go, yeah, it's a BS. Was that me? It was me. It was okay. But I remember getting this word and at the time, you know, there was a thousand people. They're all cheering and I was cheering. And God, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, yeah, but you're going to go broke first. <laughs> Said my wife's not gonna like that, and um, and I did. I went not totally broke, but I went pretty broke. And why was that? Because God was changing the way that I was believing. I had a a system of believing and praying over finances, and He was changing that into something different, changing me into something different. Because He didn't want me just believing for finances for the moment. What he wanted me believing for was finances that could change things on the earth. People with great finance have sown into campaigns and they've changed the trajectory of our political and criminal systems. But what could you do with great finance? Listen. You can only take so many vacations. You can only have so many cars. You can only live in such a house. What would you really do if you had great finance? What would you really want to do 
Would it just be to just live an exorbitant lifestyle? I don't think so. Because the Spirit of God dwells within you. I think you'd want to help people. And I think you would. And the last thing I want to say about dominion. Dominion doesn't mean that we lay the hammer down on people. Dominion means that we have dominion over the creation that we're here on earth, but I don't have dominion over you and you don't have dominion over me. And I'm commanded to love you and you're commanded to love me. And all revelation that comes from heaven, all revelation, thousand percent of it is love based. Like it's ladled out of the pot of love. So all revelation is love revelation. People that fall like Lucifer, they get puffed up on the revelation. But revelation that's bathed in love isn't puffed up. It's even keeled. It doesn't need to be worshipped or adored. Because it's love. All, all revelation of God is love, love revelation. And he won't give you any other kind of revelation. You can get other kinds of revelation, but not from God. What do you mean you can get other kinds? You can get other kinds of revelation. Peter got revelation he was a Christ, but then 10 minutes later he had a revelation from the devil. You can get other revelation, but it's never merciful, it's never gracious, it's never full of love of God. Even when God has given me revelation that was judgment, there wasn't harshness in it. It wasn't like, it wasn't like oh, yay. Because all revelation from God is love-based. So this dominion and authority, you might say, well, somebody yelled at me and I, I was going to use my dominion. No, you wouldn't use it for that. To yell back at them or to curse them or anything. You wouldn't use it that. Now, you might use it if somebody starts cursing and swearing. You might command the devil to shut up. But you're going to love the person. Anyways, I, I wanted to make sure I said that before we finish tonight. So I believe this, I believe that the Holy Spirit is pouring out wisdom, knowledge, understanding, capability to increase our financial lives. And the word that, I'm thinking about the word that Kim gave me was so enormous that there's no way that I could figure it out on my own. There's just no way. And he told me the way, he actually told me the way that it was going to happen through the stock market, which I look at it now and I go, it's in a really bad place right now. <laughs> you know, it's like, like, will it even survive? And so I'm like, okay. God knows he has timing. He has that circular revelation. If I wasn't ready for it 10 years ago, maybe I'm ready for it now. Whatever you may not have been ready for 10 years ago, maybe you're ready for it now. Can you say amen? amen? All right, with that, I pray that God's grace would be with you. And I pray that his kingdom would be with you.